Bradley Thomas is a down-on-his-luck ex-drug runner who just got fired from his job as a tow truck driver. For months, he's been working late in order to make ends meet, but his wife Lauren took his absence as a sign of infidelity, seizing the opportunity to have an affair herself. The memory of Lauren's miscarriage years ago haunts the couple, but Bradley leverages their current troubles to suggest they try again. So he re-enters the drug trafficking business, picking up and delivering packages for an old friend named Gil. After 18 months, Bradley has made a significant change in his and Lauren's lives. They're in a better house, drive nicer cars, and they have a little girl on the way. We follow Bradley as Gil has assigned him a job in collaboration with a trafficker named Eleazar. Eleazar's men, Pedro and Roman, accompany Bradley out to sea where they make the pickup, but upon returning to land, disobey Bradley's orders before walking into a shootout with police. Bradley has the option to escape, but upon hearing the cops' cries of distress, chooses to turn on his associates, leading to Pedro's death and his and Roman's arrest. During his interrogation, Detective Watkins reveals that this is Bradley's first offense. We get the impression that he is uncharacteristically noble for being in Involved in such a criminal enterprise. Because of your selfless actions, no police were killed in that event, which tells me that you know the difference between right and wrong and that you have a moral compass. Watkins delivers the most overt description of Bradley's character we hear throughout the film, and it's justified as both a sincere comment from a grateful onlooker and a tactic employed by a detective to draw information out of a guilty culprit. Nothing about this film is black and white, especially the color palette, which weaponizes a cold, gray tone against the viewer's senses. Bradley's situation is only getting bleaker, and the story demands we put ourselves in his shoes. Nothing embodies this increasingly dour downward spiral better than Bradley's story about the cream. After he was fired and discovered his wife's affair, but before they agreed to start a new chapter in life, Bradley told Lauren about his persistent struggle to pick out the cream from among regular and skim milk in the story frequency. Every time I go in, there are those labels for face to wear, and I have to guess which one's the real stuff, the cream. The law of averages says one out of three times I, I ought to get the cream, but it doesn't happen. This analogy encapsulates Bradley's luck in general and foreshadows the snowballing sequence of adversity to come. On your first watch, you may think it's preposterous for one man to suffer so gravely, but firstly, it's on theme, and secondly, what unfolds is not at all disconnected from cause and effect. Bradley encounters directly the consequences of his own actions. In fact, much of his suffering, especially in the latter half of the film, is taken on by him voluntarily. Time out. Have you seen this movie? Because if you haven't, you should. If I haven't sold it to you by now, just be warned that the biggest spoilers have yet to come and Brawl in Cell Block 99 is undeniably best viewed blind, with no knowledge of the plot whatsoever. It's not too late to stop watching now and come back after you've seen it. I say this partially on principle, I prefer to avoid spoilers wherever possible, but also because I went into it blind and was simply floored by what I saw. You know if I'm giving you two spoiler warnings is not without reason. You okay? South of okay, north of cancer. Cell Block 99 is a tragedy, a character study, and a revenge thriller all in one. It's able, in part, to pull off the genre fusion so well because of how it dispenses with Hollywood's method of checklist plots and targeted messaging and just focuses on the characters. This film does a lot of things right, but the amount of well-defined characters who are totally peripheral to Bradley's story, in combination with some of the best dialogue writing in the past decade, makes the character work stand out. I promise I can put a great big smile on each of those nuts. No thanks. I don't want anyone to see their braces. We are introduced to Lauren Thomas by Bradley learning of her affair immediately after he was fired from his job. There is no pretense of a perfect character here. Our first impression of her is bound to lean to the negative and yet she doesn't come off as entitled or ungrateful. She made a mistake and doesn't deny it. She is decidedly human, capable of doing wrong and of feeling guilt. Bradley destroys her car in order to vent his anger, and when he enters the house to have a discussion, her first instinct is to leave. They reveal they've struggled with alcohol before, but have managed to remain sober for years now. She may very well have been the victim of Bradley's abuse at some point in the past, but their history is left ambiguous, leaving room for the audience to project their own understanding of their relationship onto the situation, making it feel more relatable and more believable. Give me some time before you get closer. 
Their conversation about beginning anew takes the form of Bradley asking very direct and pointed questions before expounding about how he's sick of waiting for their situation to improve on its own and then telling Lauren that he's going back to drug running. Instead of making their past clear to the viewer, the scene drip feeds us information about these characters. The fact that Bradley is inhumanly resistant to pain when enraged, that Lauren didn't know he was working late in order to help provide for her and stay out of a bottle, and that Bradley ends the talk as though he was the director of a meeting. Will you abide? More on that later. Back to the skim milk analogy for a moment. The first container I grab is always that milk or that skim stuff. It's never the one I want. Bradley is fired from his job, his locker key snaps on him, trash is spilled out across his yard, his wife is cheating on him, and after seemingly made a positive change in his life and rushing to the aid of the police against his delinquent associates, the judge sentences him to seven years in prison as opposed to the five he suspected he would get. Skim milk is a metaphor to us, but for Bradley it's a way of life. When Bradley arrives at the fridge, his social worker is a woman named Denise. Her scene is brief and mostly serves as a segue into Bradley's first visit, but what it achieves is remarkable all the same. The men in this prison are unpleasant and tyrannical, trying at every turn to keep Bradley under their boot. Denise is the only person not trying to get something from Bradley or put him in a box of their own design. She listens to him, and with utter sincerity delivers the news that his wife's obstetrician is visiting because of complications with the pregnancy. It's only in Denise's presence, professional and compassionate, that Bradley momentarily lets down his guard before returning to his usual stoic demeanor. She provides a stark contrast to the oppressive atmosphere of prison and gives Bradley the only relief he will get for the remainder of the film. You can't help but notice that even when the plot extends Bradley the courtesy of a character who doesn't have it out for him, she is still the vehicle for nauseatingly bad news. Bradley's visitor is not Lauren's obstetrician, though. This is the Placid Man. If he wasn't morbid enough at first glance, his long yellow nails and ghoulish voice cement him as an uncanny force of evil. He shows Bradley a photo of Lauren, restrained and blindfolded, and threatens to have an abortionist mutilate the baby, but keep it alive if he does not cooperate. The Placid Man works for Eleazar, who wants compensation from Bradley for having killed Pedro and torpedoing the job for which he was hired. Bradley is given a simple task. Kill a man named Christopher Bridge in cell block 99 of Red Leaf Prison, a maximum security facility. In order to get there, he'll need to prove to the Fridge's guards that he's too much of a threat for them to handle. In return for killing Christopher Bridge, the Placid Man promises Lauren and the baby safety. Bradley collects himself and agrees to the terms, knowing full well the unhinged course of action he'll have to take in order to protect his family. This brings us to Andre, an obstinate guard who coaches the prison boxing program. He is antagonistic on Bradley's first day and downright mocking on the second. It's through his initial interaction with Bradley that we get scraps of information on his earlier life, but only by his repeatedly dodging Andre's questions. You ever try it? Boxing? I want to spend some time in the ring when I was younger. Andre asks if Bradley got whooped, implying that Bradley would be hesitant to discuss his failings in the ring, but he answers no. So Andre asks if the pay wasn't good enough, to which Bradley remains silent. And we get the impression that Bradley wasn't necessarily fighting because he wanted to. I don't have a heap of great memories from back then. Would you rather make desks and parts of vending machines? I'd rather knit baby booties with pink yarn than hit people for no reason. Despite Bradley's obvious reluctance to join the prison boxing program, Andre continues to pester him. That is, right up until he gets back from his visit with the Placid Man. Something gave Andre a change of heart. Maybe word moved so quickly in prison that Andre heard Bradley and Lauren were having trouble with their baby, but probably not. As with many finer plot details, it's never made explicit to the viewer. It would appear that Andre felt remorseful and apologized for his rudeness independently of anyone or anything else. One would imagine that Andre's penitent attitude would have Bradley thinking twice about what he's about to do, but that just demonstrates the commitment he has to his family. Bradley has made up his mind, and nothing, not even a genuine apology from the nicest guard he'll meet throughout the film, will make him waver. I was just hoping to get you in the prison boxing program, you know? Man, I'm telling you... One hour and 11 minutes in, we get the film's first fight scene, not counting the car. No music to accompany it, just raw combat. 
Bradley remains silent, but Andre gets increasingly desperate and vocally frustrated. With every blow struck, it's clear that Bradley has the advantage, but the scene only gains intention because we know he isn't fighting to win. He's causing trouble in order to be punished. The idea that he would exercise what little freedom he has to mercilessly beat and maim a prison guard after everything else that's happened and what he said reminds us that Bradley has a mind of his own and that he does not care how his actions are perceived by those around him. If it's not evident enough from his snappy dialogue, Bradley's a smart guy. His intelligence is conveyed to us not through overt feats of brilliance, but by his resourcefulness and unconventional thinking. We are never privy to the decisions Bradley makes before he's actually made them and we've seen the results. The film doesn't hold your hand through narration or monologuing. With poise and temperance, Bradley simply acts, and we only understand why he did what he did after the fact. What is crystal clear, however, is his motivation. Despite a distinct lack of fight scenes up till now, Bradley's rampage through the American prison system is justified by a conviction to keep his family safe. He doesn't need to say anything. The film is a masterclass in visual storytelling. Every calculated move and clever remark is further evidence that beneath that cold exterior, Bradley's thoughts are never so quiet. And another aspect of the film's cinematic language in need of praise is the careful use of camera angles communication between us hasn't been much she says as the camera pulls out to illustrate the distance between them both physical and conceptual the film often uses both steady wide angles and more focused handheld shots in scenes but one style will thematically dominate the other the camera angles in their new home are wide and stagnant the stability of the shots is reflective of the stability Bradley has provided for his family. Notice how the instant he gets a call from Gil regarding the job that will land him in prison, we cut from a steady wide shot to a rocky handheld angle. The film commands our engagement by drawing us into these intimate and often agitating moments. Better yet is when Bradley is on the job with Pedro and Roman. There is one noteworthy wide angle, framing the men before they leave to make the pickup and again upon their return, but for the most part this scene features tense, prolonged handheld shots. The lack of dialogue reinforces Bradley's professionalism, but also subtly unnerves the viewer. After the men disobey Bradley, assault him, and walk off with the bags, he just calmly pursues them. Without his expression of mild annoyance, you'd question if he were phased by what just happened at all. On your first watch, these shots that follow Bradley as he walks are almost hypnotic. They're drawn out and rather uneventful, but they do a great job of communicating his character to us. There is little to no difference in Bradley's posture when he's walking down his unfaithful wife or simply delivering a package. He is always on guard, but simultaneously always collected, blurring the line between violent intent and everyday business. The camera angles following him are roughly the same in each scene, but we don't know what Bradley will do until he does it, keeping us on the edge of our seats. For the first half of the film, the camera is consistently positioned at eye level with Bradley or below, emphasizing his stature. He looms over every other character and without ever verbalizing it, the film is sure to instill in the viewer Bradley's presence as a force to be reckoned with. The wide camera angles that cover everything from Bradley's home to Gill's pool room and the hallways in the prison are all meant to exaggerate the contrast between those regular spaces and his tiny cell. The first time he enters his cell in the fridge, it is the smallest space he's been in for the entire film. Having no idea where the plot is going, it's likely you'd feel just as much despair as he does upon entering what guards casually refer to as his coffin. Most camera angles frame Bradley from below, but in his cell we see him from above. He's made to look small and captive, a powerful subliminal technique used to intensify the transition from freedom to imprisonment. It is no mistake that Bradley's journey through the prison system begins with him in a cell on a high floor, then transitions to Redleaf, where the camera is careful to display the long downhill by which he arrived, and then finally ends with him in cell block 99, a literal dungeon beneath the prison where inmates are deliberately abused. The film is the documentation of Bradley's descent into hell. And so, it is also no mistake that when Bradley finally confronts Eleazar in order to have his wife released into Gil's custody, this is their interaction. Tell me your code or it's the other leg. Seven, seven, seven. Lastly, what is probably my favorite use of visual storytelling takes place early on and only benefits from repeat viewings. After having been fired, we sit with Bradley on his dispirited drive home. The music he's listening to is a bit too appropriate for the occasion, and he stops the song after hearing the lyric, Stuff won't last forever. 
He pulls up at a traffic light and alongside his shabby car stops a polished, bright purple lowrider. The two men in that car do not reappear later in the film and don't have a single line of dialogue, so you may think I'm either reaching or racist for believing they represent the criminally affluent, but you don't have to dig very deep to gather the purpose of their inclusion in this scene. Bradley is now, at his lowest low so far, confronted with what his own life could have been if he had chosen a different career path. After the 18-month transition, we follow Bradley on his drive home from a job for Gil, and now the script has flipped completely. We're at the same spot as last time, but Bradley is in a much nicer car, not looking on at those who are better off than him, but seeing instead the product of his labor, a drug-addled homeless man on a street corner. The music he's listening to is not somber or remorseful, but grateful and celebratory, a juxtaposition that seems to weigh on Bradley's conscience. Cell Block 99 has thematic depth to it that cannot be ignored. With the cinematography out of the way, let's take a look at how power is used and abused in order to make character interactions both gripping and believable. In covering this motif, there is no better place to start than with Mr. Irving. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Reclaim your possessions and take your place at the end of the line. Mr. Irving wields his authority as an admissions officer like a weapon. From his seat, behind a glass barrier, his entire job revolves around taking inventory of prisoners' possessions. His job is clearly trivial for a man of his intelligence, and so, for his own gratification, he sends prisoners to the back of the line after even the slightest transgression so that they may share in his tedium even if only for as long as it takes them to come back around. He's stuck in a box all day, and the only way he can feel powerful is by abusing his impotent authority. I think Mr. Irving is one of the best characters in the movie, which is saying something, but is not wholly unique in his abuse of power. Gil, Bradley's old friend and employer, exercises power by cutting a deal with Bradley for doing the Eleazar job, giving him extra time off work after his baby is born. This characterizes Gil as wily and manipulative, backed up by his occupation, demeanor, and his seemingly friendly tone of voice. Detective Watkins exercises power by appealing to Bradley's sense of morality and justice in order to get information out of him. He is ultimately unsuccessful, but despite Bradley's aloofness, there is clearly a chord struck between these two during the interrogation. Bradley and Watkins are both patriots. The detective asks if he's content with letting the people he works for wipe their behinds with the American flag before admitting to knowing that Bradley flies one above his front door. He will not give up the names of his associates, but he is sure to mention that he, in fact, has two flags. The detective's interrogation tricks worked. To an extent, just not in the way he was hoping. Bradley Thomas should have received the paperwork earlier. Don't tell me my business. I do things direct, and I have a system. Besides being the most charismatic antagonist of the film, Warden Tuggs exercises his power more directly and blatantly, because, when compared to other characters, his power is far more tangible. He is the warden of a maximum security prison and wears that fact on his sleeve as though it's a war medal. He exercises his power by employing intimidation tactics, giving orders to guards who don't even work for him, and reassigning Bradley to a less hospitable cell on the spot. So, for the fall. You mean 56. That's what I meant. Read it wrong. It's 56. Basically, all of the prison staff exercise their power tyrannically, to varying degrees. Andre is persistently patronizing, Wilson is vindictively sadistic, and these guards are casually irreverent, belittling Bradley for making what he thought was an innocuous remark. Just one example of how deeply the film is layered in differing perspectives. Looks like we're locking up another genius. Oh, should we let him go so he can cure cancer? But what about Bradley himself? If anything, Brawl in Cell Block 99 is the opposite of a power fantasy, but not for lack of a capable protagonist. The writer had an interesting challenge here. How do we make Bradley, a man who is inhumanly resistant to pain and highly intelligent, into an underdog? The solution? By making his life suck. Dramatically and unrelentingly. If we define power as the agency to make meaningful change on one's own behalf, then it's easy to see how the film tries at every turn to strip the protagonist of power and figuratively beat him into submission. But the type of power Bradley exercises throughout the film is unlike anything we see from the other characters. After he's fired and Lauren's infidelity has been revealed, he commands her to sit with him and gets right down to business. How long? Serious? Why? I want to try again. I'm going back to work for Gil. Will you abide? He's more sincere and vulnerable with Lauren than with anyone else, but even now, at his lowest low so far, he maintains his resolve and control of the situation. If something comes up, I got the reins. They shall mind you. Bradley takes care in establishing the pecking order with Eleazar's men. He runs the show. And when Pedro and Roman disobey and throw punches at him, he doesn't immediately react. He doesn't even say anything. 
he keeps his composure and walks them down before the cops arrive. After dodging Roman's gunfire and grenade by taking cover in the waters below, Bradley attempts to climb up a dock pole, but slips right down. It's at times like this when you'd expect the character to try something else. Another route, a different method, but not Bradley. He committed to climbing that pole and persevered until he got up. Not only does he take control of every situation he's in, he does not give up trying in spite of laughably unfavorable odds. In the interrogation with Detective Watkins, it's evident that Bradley had resigned himself to prison time before their conversation even started. The detective learns nothing. Bradley doesn't give an inch. Even now that he's been taken into custody, he dictates the flow of conversation. During his time in both prisons, we see that Bradley has a penchant for undermining other people's power with clever comments. So when his sheer size and intractable bluntness don't suffice in letting you know who's boss, he's ready to disarm you with wit and attitude. Do not blink until I give you permission to blink. Bradley is forever defiant. He answers to no one. He cannot be tamed, controlled, or subverted. His spirit endures despite facing a living hell. There is nothing that can break him. He refuses to even let his name be abbreviated. Brad? Bradley? Brad. Brad, what's wrong with you? Miss Bradley. Brad. Bradley. Bradley. Bradley exercises his dominance by never yielding to those around him and maintaining self-control even when brutalizing his enemies. Eleazar asserts his power by threatening Bradley's wife and unborn child, but Bradley has the immediate upper hand based on raw strength and uses that to turn the tides in his favor. Bradley's power does not consist in conniving tactics or institutionally enshrined authority. His power comes from within. It is wholly his to summon and command. No one can take it away from him because it is something he has cultivated entirely on his own. You might protest. There is nothing special about someone like Bradley being so uncompromisingly stoic because of how large and strong he is. And there's merit in that idea, but only if you disregard Bradley's experiences and focus solely on his physicality. From the tattoo, to the deadpan stare, to the hints he drops in dialogue, the film paints a picture of a man with a troubled past. One that clearly involved violence and anguish that likely helped him develop his sense of humor as a coping mechanism. Aside from his foggy backstory, the plot is rife with examples of Bradley suffering in ways that his raw physical strength would not attenuate. He gets laid off. His wife was unfaithful. He won't get to see his child grow up. Powerful people are threatening his family, and eventually Eventually, he comes to terms with the fact that he's gone too far in his efforts to protect them. You have a wife? Yeah. Is she gonna wait for you? She would have. Brute force is just a tool Bradley uses to accomplish his goals. His power comes from his resolve, his mental fortitude, his unwillingness to give up. No amount of raw strength would make it easier to endure the domino track of calamity Bradley faces in this story. The pain and trauma he suffered through years ago shaped him into the titan he is today, which is why he goes about his deranged mission with such conviction and certainty. He knows what must be done in order to protect his wife and baby, and does not doubt his own ability to do so. Try and open that gate or gas me. I'll murder them both. He'll do it. Efficiently. The ambiguity surrounding Bradley's past raises an interesting question. Was Bradley born this way, or was he created by the experiences he would rather forget? Regardless, he is a thoroughly compelling character, disarming his detractors with wit and cunning, and overpowering his opponents with bewildering strength and endurance. While our protagonist is repeatedly portrayed as an unstoppable force of nature, the film is sure to remind you that he is still human and capable of self-control. When Gil asks how to pronounce the n-word in a friendly manner, Bradley replies that Gil is wasting his time even asking. This is important as it establishes that Bradley does not hold any particular racial prejudice, but is totally willing to stoop to that level in order to provoke a prison fight. Last time I checked, the colors of the flag weren't red, white, and burrito. While its merits as a character study cannot be overstated, Cell Block 99 is, simply put, a good movie. You probably won't come out of the experience happier than when you went in, I mean I did, but that's beside the point, but by the end of it, there's a palpable sense that what you just watched meant something. No pandering or committee-approved plot points, no heavy-handed messaging or one-note thoughtless characters, just a tightly written, enthralling story with plausible direction, original dialogue, and bittersweet closure by the end. The film sprinkles moments of levity throughout to keep the tone from reaching the absolute depths of despair. And although it doesn't exactly compensate for the dour atmosphere that dominates the experience, it is refreshing to see the script not taking itself absolutely seriously. One with the pool, the one with the pool table. The table. He calls it the billiards room, but I don't know, it's just fully plays in there. 
From the footsteps of an unknown quantity of men ominously approaching Gill and Bradley, to the use of the same song in the film's opening as when Lauren is being dropped off at Gill's, it's undeniable that great passion and care went into crafting this film and it will stand the test of time for it. The cinematography, direction, and performances all lend themselves to a single, coherent, captivating creative vision. The character acting is the best I've seen in years, with inventive dialogue and authentic character traits used to great effect. The supporting cast never feel unimportant but do make you believe that they inhabit this world and their roles therein. Fred Melamed's performance as Mr. Irving is phenomenal. You just love to hate him. His voice should be soothing, but what he says and the way he says it just makes you wanna... The tragedy at this film's core has many sides to it. Bradley knows he won't make it out of Redleaf alive and so goes all out in his attempts to protect his family from inside the prison. Additionally, owed to her captive state over the past number of days, Lauren is unaware of how much trouble Bradley has brought on himself and still believes him to be serving the same seven-year sentence in the fridge he had before she was taken. During their final phone call, he deflects and lies to her about the prospect of visits and thus she has no idea she'll never see him again. Bradley's story, one of unimaginable heartache and perseverance, will be lost to the ages. The only record keepers are a drug trafficker and Warden Tugs, the former being a criminal no one would trust or believe, and the latter being a ruthless prison tyrant who would be happy to let Bradley be forgotten. Not only did Bradley give his life in order to save those of his wife and child, but he did so knowing that everyone he crossed on his way to the bottom would believe him to be either criminally insane or barbarically evil. Our hero is the victim of unmitigated cosmic misfortune, but remains resolute all the same. An underdog in every way that counts, but also a man of unshakable faith and grit a devoted father and husband of mythological proportions. This film is everything a cinephile could ask for. Strong characters, themes, and performances, supported by a cogent script and infused with style and heart. An instant classic I could easily keep throwing praise at for another hour, but I think I'll leave it there. As always, I love discussion and debate, so if you have any criticism of my take on Brawl and Cellblock 99, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. See you next time.